Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. In our last episode, we examined a series of classical sources to see what glimpses of information we could find about the East African coast in antiquity. What we found was a history that was as intriguing as it was incomplete, attestation of ancient maritime trade hubs, including the famous metropolis of Rapta, which sadly remain largely enigmatic to this day. In today's episode, we focus our attention to the early history of a specific small island off the coast of Tanzania, one which in the time we discuss is still just an obscure locale, but will one day blossom into the most important city in the region and the focus of our season. Let's explore the proto-history of Kilwa's earliest years. Season 6, Episode 4, Second Fiddle in East Africa. You might have noticed that throughout the early episodes of the season, I've been reluctant to label the people of the eponymous Swahili coast as Swahili, or even the more flexible ancestors of the Swahili. And there's a reason for that. When examining the distant past, it can be quite difficult to try and make concrete links of descent between the people of then and the people of now. However, that will change today, as in this time period is when we get our first evidence for the emergence of a unique cultural construct, perhaps the oldest sign of an emerging distinct group that would one day be known as the Waswahili. The demographics of the coastal region of East Africa was, like many parts of the continent, dramatically transformed by the Bantu expansion. Of course, one of the main ways that archaeologists can track the spread and impact of Bantu settlements in eastern Africa is the always significant discovery of pottery sherds. The key style of pottery here was a new form known as kwale ware. It first arrived in Kenya and inland Tanzania around the turn of the first millennium BC, and kwale ware was notably distinct from pre-existing pottery styles. Kwale ware was widely associated with sites linked to other signs of Bantu settlements, such as early iron making, leading to Kwale ware being used as the main barometer we have for tracking the chronology and geography of Bantu migration in East Africa. So we should be able to track something of a Swahili ethnogenesis through the arrival of Kwale ware at Swahili associated settlements, right? And, uh, yeah, if only it could be that simple. Confusingly enough, settlements associated with the ancestors of the Waswahili, the ones that we can say for more certainty are related to them, are notable for their unusual lack of kwale ware. Instead, starting around the 5th century AD, we see the emergence of an entirely unique and different style of pottery, distinct from both the Bantu-associated kwale ware and from the pre-existing pre-expansion pottery in the region. Instead, this type of pottery, which is known varyingly as tonneware, ware, triangle incised ware, or kitchen ware, is notably distinct from its neighboring styles. It features long-necked jars, triangular designs marked into the clay with incisions, and unique methods of pasting the exterior. Triangle incised ware is consistently the most common type of pottery found at sites that are associated with Swahili settlement leading most of the archaeologists to use this type of pottery as a signpost, rather than kwale ware, for the presence of the ancestors of the Waswahili living in an area. The unique nature of this pottery style, however, has led to more questions than answers about the origin of Swahili culture. Theories on the origin of triangle incised ware can vary substantially, ranging from it just being a mere stylistic evolution, a distinct style but ultimately a descendant of the more ordinary kwale ware, perhaps a style which drew some influence from pre-Bantu populations and some Bantu influence, or a style that was brought by a later wave of distinct Bantu settlers centuries after the first Bantu migrations in the region associated with kwale ware. The earliest examples we have of triangle incised ware come from the very northernmost region of the Swahili coast, in a series of dense forests called the Makaya located inland from cities like modern-day Mombasa and Malindi. These enclosed forests, which are known individually as Kaya, meaning homestead in Kiswahili, are of paramount cultural, historic, and religious significance, not only for the Waswahili, but for numerous other closely linked ethnic groups. These forests often contain settlements built in specific layouts featuring repeated motifs, 
leading many scholars to consider them a fascinating example of pre-colonial African urban planning, as well as an example that maybe should provide some inspiration for making today's cities more adaptive, cohesive, and friendly to our natural world. If you'd like to learn more about the history of the Makaya forests, these fascinating UNESCO World Heritage Sites in modern Kenya, then you can check out our newest premium episode about the subject on Patreon. And to those already supporting the show on Patreon, a heartfelt thank you. In addition to their cultural significance, Makaya also holds special archaeological importance. Many of the very oldest examples of triangle incised ware come from the Makaya of Kenya. Now, it's worth noting that while the triangle incised ware is primarily associated with the expansion of Swahili culture, it's far from exclusively associated with the Waswahili. Triangle incised ware is found in numerous sites related to other peoples who speak the Sabaki language family, a subfamily of Bantu language that contains Ki Swahili but also the Mijikendi languages of southern Kenya, the Mwani of northern Mozambique, and many, many others. What's important here is that Sabaki languages and sites associated with the speakers all seem to share the same distinct triangle incised pottery style, and that the movement of this pottery seemed to generally travel in a southerly direction throughout the early medieval period. For this reason, most anthropologists favor one of two ideas that the ancestors of the Sabaki-speaking peoples, including the ancestors of the Waswahili, were part of the original Bantu migration around 0 AD, that they settled in the Makaya of southern Kenya, developed their own unique style of pottery there, and then dispersed further south along the coast in the following centuries. Alternatively, some other anthropologists claim that this was a different process altogether that other Bantu-speaking groups had already reached the coast of Kenya, and that later on, centuries later on, the ancestors of the Sabaki migrated to the Makaya, and then again began migrating southward, integrating themselves into pre-existing Bantu communities along the coast. The debate is very much still an open one on this issue, so it's hard to say with much certainty. But what we can say with some degree of certainty is that by the late 8th or early 9th century AD, the ancestors of the Waswahili arrived at a small island off the coast of Tanzania. Known as Kilwa Kisiwani, or the Island of Kilwa, this little island which would one day become perhaps the single most influential location in the entirety of East Africa, started with, characteristically, humble origins. If Kilwa Kisiwani did have pre-Swahili inhabitants, it appears that they didn't leave us much of a trace behind archaeologically, meaning that they likely never set up any permanent settlements on the site, but were rather nomadic or semi-nomadic people who occasionally might have stopped by. The very earliest archaeological sites at Kilwa appear with the arrival of the early Swahili, as their triangle incised pottery starts to suddenly appear all over the place. Since most archaeological research at Kilwa has focused on the more eye-catching sites from later eras, comparatively little attention has been paid to the chronologically earliest sites on the island. However, from what little we do know, Early Kilwa Kisiwani appeared to be settled by small communities living in little square houses made out of wattle and daub, and covered on top by thatched roofs. Given the number of these residential sites that we can find, the small island is estimated to have had a population at this time of maybe just under a hundred people at most. Large piles of fish remains in these ancient trash dumps indicate that the locals persisted off of a primarily pescatarian diet while the vast majority of pottery at the site was locally produced. Most interestingly, the area seemed to produce an abnormally high amount of refined iron products, which might indicate that it was something of a major hub of metallurgy, even from an early date. But if it did hold this status, it was pretty minor compared to what it would one day become. Essentially, Kilwa Kisiwani in the 9th century hosted only an ordinary, if maybe slightly larger than average, village. For a region that would one day become the most important urban center on the coast, it's hard to believe that it could have origins this humble, and that it would actually remain in this humble status for a century or more. However, the slow growth of Kilwa in the late 9th and 10th centuries makes more sense when you consider the context of East African history at the time, as well as the system of currents and monsoon winds that governed the region's trade routes. One of the defining traits of early Kilwa is the surprising lack of evidence for it being part of an extensive foreign trade route at this time. 
For a city that would one day become famous as the preeminent mercantile hub in the region, early Kiowa contains shockingly sparse evidence of foreign merchants. Now, that's not to say that there's a complete lack of evidence. About 3% of pottery discovered in these earliest layers are of foreign origins, with almost all of them being Persian styles of pottery. And uh, keep that Persian connection in the back of your head, because it is going to be important later. So it's safe to say that the people of Kilwa had contact with foreign merchants, but since 97% of the pottery was locally produced, that the relationship they had was maybe of limited concern at most. The lack of early interest in Kilwa from foreign merchants likely derives from a combination of factors, including the geographical, economic, and political. Geographically, Kilwa suffered from being, well, kinda out of the way of things and on the fringes of the major trade routes in the region. One of the big advantages that East Africa's ports had is that they were in pretty close proximity to one of the most widely trafficked trade routes in the world, the route from the Mediterranean to India. While ships would occasionally make their way far south enough to reach Kilwa, the town was a pretty big journey from this major trade route. If sailors on this lucrative trade route were interested in stopping on the African coast, then there were far more attractive destinations available closer to them. In particular, further north in modern-day Eritrea, the port of Adulis, though a shell of its former self, still retained some degree of vestigial importance as a primary port of ancient Aksum. By the 9th century, the city had been devastated by foreign raids and had been isolated from its Aksumite core, but it still did have at least some of a reputation. But while Adulis was a rapidly fading star in the region, the other major ports that were rapidly rising to replace it were not located near Kilwa. Rather, they mostly existed along the Somali coast. In particular, the city of Mogadishu was quickly rising to become the main staple port of the East African coast. Apart from being located further north, much closer to the ever-important Red Sea trade routes, Mogadishu also held an advantage in the availability of goods that it could offer. The city trafficked gold from the heartlands of Ethiopia, acting as the main outlet for this precious metal after Adulis' decline. Somali merchants from Mogadishu also profited heavily in the trade of leather, precious aromatic tree saps, ivory, enslaved workers, textiles, and much more. If you were an Indian Ocean merchant, Mogadishu was already a well-established port of call. It had all the infrastructure that you would need, and even had local rulers minting their own unique coins to make exchange easier. Medieval Arab chronicles about the Indian Ocean from this period mention Mogadishu without fail and often in great detail as the most significant port in the area. Kilwa was lucky to even get a brief mention at this time, and it usually didn't. Now, spoiler alert, while Kilwa will eventually surpass Mogadishu as the most important center of trade, even when that happens, Mogadishu will still remain an incredibly significant hub. The two cities will remain economic and political rivals throughout the entirety of the medieval period, with Mogadishu maintaining the upper hand in the relationship pretty far into the era, and in the end, Mogadishu will outlast Kilwa and regain its status as the Pearl of East Africa. However, for such a crucial maritime port, Mogadishu did have one incredibly crippling weakness. The fact that it didn't actually have that good of a harbor. While well, today the city of Mogadishu possesses a fairly robust harbor for shipping, this harbor was an artificial invention of the modern age. In the 1960s, the government of Somalia extended two small peninsulas outward from the ocean, hugging the coastline and forming a tremendous harbor, which is still the most widely used in Somalia today. But in the medieval period, the coast of Somalia was far less ideal for the landing or docking of ships, with few outlets for natural harbors. The coastline was largely flat and subject to ordinary currents. It was difficult for sailors to park their ships there, and the fact that it became a major center of trade despite this geographic disadvantage is a testament to just how financially rewarding a trip to the city could be. Kilwa's geography, on the other hand, is like if you asked a port engineer to design the perfect harbor. Kilwa Kisiwani, depending on which version of accounts you believe, we'll talk about that next episode, was either a permanent island or an ephemeral sandbar island, surrounded on its north and south by two larger landmasses. To the north, the peninsula of Kilwa Masoko, and to the south, the large tidal island of Songo Nara. Each of these landmasses absorbed a portion of the intense monsoon winds that the region received, creating a relatively gentle body of water surrounding Kilwa, one almost more like a lagoon than a harbor. 
On the occasion when monsoon rains did flood the waterway, extensive mangrove swamps surrounding the southern perimeter of the island dramatically reduced the potential damage that the island took. To make things even better, the Kiowa Bay features three major estuaries for small but largely navigable rivers. While it isn't on the bay, Tanzania's most significant navigable river, the Rufiji, empties into the ocean not too far north of Kilwa as well, making Kilwa Bay the closest major port to this additional major inland waterway as well. While the city was still behind its contemporaries in terms of economic significance, its advantageous geography meant that when circumstances changed and the area did become a popular destination for merchants, it would be playing with a stack deck in its favor. It's not especially clear when this would begin to change, but the archaeological record suggests that the late 10th century was a watershed moment in the history of Kilwa, when the city began its march to become a true metropolis. However, even the story of Kilwa's expansion is far from without controversy. Join us in our next episode as we explore the semi-mythical origins of Kilwa's explosive growth and the controversial history of a Persian prince on a journey. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like our show, then we would greatly appreciate if you could help support the show and our project of freely available online history education. You can do this by supporting us at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or iTunes, or by sharing the podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy learning about African history. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including... Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Dimitri, Alexander Travis, B.B. Milliam, Conrad Schwenke, Pascal Mokocha, Joe Maxwell, Nketchu Nwambodike, Kwajo Amankwa, Douglas Harder and Sherry Robinson, Craig Bolton, Samuel Bado, Rasan Firgiani, Ni T, Kitty, Matt T, Tariq Beetleman, Kelvin J. Norris, Ellen Fisher, Jessica, Switzen Blair, and Yannick Bolnett, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really, 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 really means a lot.